So you're Lehman Brothers in late 2007. Now, most people today have heard of the name Lehman Brothers before, but few understand just how much of a behemoth Lehman was. At the time, you had $639 billion in assets, which put Lehman Brothers as the biggest bankruptcy ever by a very large margin, making companies like Enron look rather pathetic. That made you the fourth largest investment bank in the US, alongside names like Goldman Sachs and Merrill Lynch. 25,000 people worked for you all over the world. Some of Wall Street's brightest minds worked for you, and you had been in business for more than 150 years. Basically, you were Wall Street royalty, and anyone who wants to get into investment banking, take their company public, or sell stock knew that Lehman Brothers was the bank to go to. And in 2007, you were in your prime. You had just come out of your biggest and best year yet, with record-breaking profits and nothing but dollar signs in your future, your stock price was at the highest it's ever been, and you were raking in $19 billion in revenue just that year. It seemed like there was nowhere to go but up. 37 points or so, Apple shares are just getting hammered this morning. We're down by between three and four and a half, down 21%. Because we're now down 43%. What in the world is happening on Wall Street? Do your no yields. What? Lehman Brothers is going bankrupt. But then on Monday, September 15, 2008, the world wakes up to the total collapse of Lehman Brothers. The investment bank that was far too big to fail files for bankruptcy at 2 a.m. on a Monday morning, marking it as the worst business failure in U.S. history. And almost instantly, Lehman Brothers brings the whole world down with it. Say a lot of their customers are freaked out. Pressure, uh, Yahoo down 8.5%, Cisco 6.5%. Down 9% today, the Zetradax over in Frankfurt is down by 9%. But why? And who was Lehman? Lehman Brothers suffering a spectacular downfall. Its stock at one point this year sold for $67 a share. Right now it's trading at just $3.65 a share. Lehman Brothers, a 158-year-old firm, filed it is for bankruptcy. It is a 2,200-page report, 15 months in the making. Of Lehman Brothers very, in the beginning of the worst financial crisis since the global financial system September 15, 2008. Decades. Sharon, this is absolutely stunning. Wall Street has seen very, very few days like this. To do what Lehman Brothers did, they use a lot of quantitative finance. Quantitative finance is basically using math and data science to analyze things like stocks in the stock market. It's what every major investment bank on Wall Street uses to manage their investment portfolios. The people that do this are called quants, and they make very good money, $117,000 a year on average to be exact. And if you want to break into this very high paying field, that's where Brilliant comes in. Brilliant is a website and app that offers interactive courses in math and science, which includes their course on math or quantitative finance. What makes Brilliant different from everything else is that it's built off of a very simple principle. You learn best by doing, not through lectures, not through repetition, and not by doing odd number exercises in a textbook. That's why with Brilliant, you get to jump right into solving problems. While being coached bit by bit before you even realize it, you've learned a fundamental concept in STEM. You get instant feedback along the way, so you can improve as fast as possible, and there aren't any tests or grades either. Just pick a topic you're curious about and get started. They even have an entire learning path dedicated to probability, statistics, and finance to help you build up to quantitative finance. And it ends with a course on cryptocurrencies, where you learn how cryptographic primitives power the blockchain and digital currencies. We live in the easiest time in human history to move up the social ladder, but the only way you're gonna do that is through self-education. And to get started on your self-education, Brilliant is giving you guys 20% off when you go to brilliant.org slash jaketran with the link below. That's brilliant.org slash jaketran to sign up for free and get 20% off. Thanks to Brilliant for sponsoring this video. There are some who see Memorial Day as just a welcome excuse for a barbecue. At Shearson Lehman Brothers, however, we see it as the day to remember those who are part of the family named Americans and who, in defense of the family, gave of themselves on battlefields and beaches, in the skies and on the seas. Let them hear the bells. Let freedom ring. Like the name suggests, Lehman Brothers was started by the Lehman Brothers, but it didn't start out as a bank at all. It was the 1840s, and Henry Lehman had just arrived in America from Germany. He became a door-to-door -door salesman in Alabama and eventually saved up enough money to open up a store that sold dry goods and other small consumer goods. One by one, his two brothers, Emmanuel and Mayer, joined him, giving rise to Lehman Brothers in 1850. 
At the time, Alabama was a cotton farming state, and the Lehman Brothers quickly started accepting cotton as a method of payment for goods in their store. They would then sell that cotton to different buyers, which eventually became a business of its own. With all the new connections they were making between cotton farmers and cotton buyers, the Lehman Brothers abandoned the idea of a grocery store and went full-time into selling cotton. Over time, they basically became cotton brokers. They connected farmers with buyers and got a fee for their services. And then in 1855, the original brother, Henry, died of yellow fever. So the two remaining brothers moved to New York to open up an office. There, they helped set up the New York Cotton Exchange. And pretty soon, they were brokering the sale of a lot of other commodities too. That continued for more than 50 years. And then they started moving away from commodities to more of investment banking as we know them today. By 1906, you as Lehman Brothers were doing pretty well for yourself in the commodities trade. You were making so many new contacts and building your network to the point where eventually, you saw that the real money was in real finance, not brokering commodity sales. So you took the skills you learned from over half a century of being the middleman for commodity sales and applied that to a new trade, underwriting. Underwriting is fancy financial jargon for when you act as the middleman for companies that want to go public. When a company wants to go public and sell their shares on the stock market, they want some kind of guarantee that their shares are going to sell for a certain price. On the other hand, the people buying the shares want to make sure it's a legit company with no skeletons in the closet. They don't want to get dumped on by company executives that just want to cash out. That's where the underwriters come in. They comb over the books, the numbers, they make sure all the regulatory requirements are met, they check with institutional investors to gauge their interest in the stock, and then they set the initial price for the stock to be sold at along with guaranteeing that a specific number of shares will be sold, all for a commission. That way, hopefully, the company wins, the underwriters win, and the people who buy the stock win. As the underwriters, if you're right, you make a lot of money. If you're wrong about the company, however, you're going to lose out on a ton of money. This was Lehman Brothers' first entry into the world of high finance, and they were very good at it. Because you already had a lot of money from commodities to back you up, you could take chances on smaller, riskier businesses other banks wouldn't touch with a six-foot pole, and your risks often paid out. One of the industries you branched into was retail, where you were the underwriter for future mega retailers like Woolworths, Studebaker, and Macy's. Over and over again, you move into a new industry and get lucky with companies that would turn into future major successes. You underwrote Paramount and Fox in the movie business, you branched into electronics companies, automakers, and at least a dozen other niches. With a healthy amount of risk taking, you managed to make it through and profit from some of the worst crises to hit the earth. The Civil War, Railroad Disasters, World War I, World War II, the stock market crash of 1929, and the Great Depression. And fast forward all the way to 1994, and Lehman Brothers was bought for $360 million by American Express. A company that had started as a grocery store had become one of the most valuable financial firms in America. Eventually, you were spun off from American Express into an independent privately managed investment bank, which is where the story of the Lehman Brothers we know today really starts. To start the new and improved Lehman Brothers off on the right foot, a lifelong employee named Richard Fold was appointed to CEO. Richard, or Dick, started working at Lehman Brothers in 1966, when he was only 20 years old. Then in 1993, he was appointed to the CEO of the company after nearly three decades with the firm. His number one goal? To absolutely kill the competition. He wanted to take Lehman Brothers to the top. And he did it by borrowing a ton of money and taking on massive risks to play the market himself. His strategy was so successful that he ended up being the longest serving CEO on Wall Street and expanded Lehman Brothers into Europe and the rest of the world. Under Dick Foles' guidance, Lehman Brothers became the best of the best. Some people see the sunset as the end of the day. Others see it as the beginning of an evening. We, however, see it as the start of a new day in Hong Kong, Singapore, and Tokyo. Expanding the horizons is capitalism at its best. And why you'll never look at a sunset quite the same again. In the early 2000s, the real estate market in the US and around the world was booming. This was because of low interest rates and a lot of incentives from the government, with even the President of the United States telling everyone they should be owning homes. Owning a home lies at the heart of the American dream. Home is a foundation for families and a source of stability for communities. It serves as the foundation of many Americans' financial security. 
more and more people started buying houses on mortgages because it was so cheap and easy to get into. You didn't even need to put much money down. So prices started skyrocketing, which led to people buying even more homes and banks issuing more mortgages. What resulted were ninja loans, mortgages to anyone and everyone with no income, no job, no assets, also known as subprime mortgages. If people ended up not paying back their mortgage, well, no problem. They could just take back the house and resell it right away since there was so much demand. And since these mortgages were so profitable, the banks who would issue these mortgages would then resell that mortgage to a bigger investment bank for a profit. For a while, it seemed like everyone was making more and more money. And that's where Lehman Brothers came into this equation. One of the ways Lehman Brothers got involved in real estate was through these mortgage-backed securities. But don't let this financial jargon fool you. Behind all the vague terms, it was actually pretty simple. Because the people who got a mortgage would be paying it off for the next 10 years or more, if you're an institutional investor, think pension funds, retirement funds, that's pretty attractive. In theory, mortgages gave you consistent, predictable, safe cash flow. That was the pitch. So investment banks like Lehman bought thousands of mortgages from these smaller banks that issued them. They would then package a bunch of mortgages together and then resold them as a mortgage-backed security. Pension funds, retirement funds, and other institutional investors would then buy them because again, it gave them consistent, predictable, safe cash flow. This business was so lucrative that you just couldn't help yourself. And at one point, you owned $76 billion worth of mortgages all over the US. But it didn't stop there. Not only was Lehman neck deep in the mortgage-backed security craze, you even borrowed a ton of money to start building commercial properties yourself, like hotels and residential complexes in the US and all over the world. By 2007, you were the biggest mortgage underwriter in the US, owning more than $22 billion in real estate. It got to the point where you had over $600 billion in assets with only $7 billion in cash. And it was working. Lehman Brothers shares were at an all-time high of $86, with a market cap of $60 billion. Your risky investments were obviously working, and all the other banks that were too scared to do the same as you were gonna get left in the dust. And it would've kept working if those bad mortgages didn't make up your entire foundation. The pessimist sees the glass as half empty. The optimist sees the glass as half full. We, however, see it as a way to quench a thirst, boil an egg, or make something grow. Seeing the possibilities is capitalism at its best, and why you'll never look at a glass of water quite the same again. Just as you hit your prime in 2007, something unexpected happened. Mortgage interest rates went back up, which meant it now costs a lot more money to get a mortgage. So the demand for houses nosedived, and with it, the demand for mortgages also nosedived. That would have been manageable if the people who already bought houses kept paying their mortgage. But there was another problem. Most of the mortgages, especially the subprime ones, were set at an adjustable interest rate. So as interest rates went up, the same people making the same income would have to pay a much higher monthly payment. So the people with no income, no job, and no assets but had a mortgage got squeezed and foreclosed on. This set off a chain reaction. Demand for houses plummeted, so the houses that got foreclosed on sat empty with no buyers. All the while, Lehman Brothers owed $44 for every $1 they had. Or in other words, Lehman had a 1 to 44 leverage ratio, while most investment banks had a ratio of only around 1 to 20 or 1 to the low 30s. Which was still insane, but if any investment bank were to fall first, it would be Lehman. How much of my assets should be in cash? How do I know when my investments are working for me? How can the investment that was right for my neighbor not be right for me? The more serious you are as an investor, the more questions you have to ask. So if you've been asking yourself these questions, talk with us and invest your time before you invest your money. Shearson Lehman American Express and the Serious Investor. Minds over money. 2008 got off to a really bad start when one of your biggest competitors, Bear Stearns, crashed and burned first. They were eventually bought out by JP Morgan with the help of the Federal Reserve, but if you were worried before, you were in full panic mode now. By September 2008, Lehman reported a third quarter loss of almost $4 billion, and your stock experiences a free fall to $7 a share from its $86 high. And your best hope? A buyout or bailout. Even though you had assets worth more than your debt, no one wanted to buy real estate anymore so those assets were worth nothing. By Friday, September 12, 2008, Lehman was losing $8 million a minute. So the US Treasury Secretary, Henry Paulson, calls a meeting with all of America's leading bank executives, the masters of the universe as they were known as. He told everyone that the US government would not be doing anything to bail out Lehman Brothers, and it would be up to these banks to decide your future, the same banks Dick Foles so desperately wanted to destroy. At the time, you weren't too worried. 
You were Lehman Brothers after all, the fourth biggest investment bank in the US. Obviously someone, a company or the government would come to your rescue. They couldn't afford to let you go under. You were too big to fail. So when Bank of America expressed interest in buying you out, things started to look bright again. But not long after, one of your other competitors, Merrill Lynch, was also in trouble. And since they had not sunk so deep into the real estate black hole, Merrill Lynch was a much more attractive choice for Bank of America to buy than Lehman Brothers. So Bank of America bought Merrill Lynch for $50 billion. By Sunday, time was running out. Your final hope? Barclays Bank, who came in on Sunday with big promises of making all your worries go away in exchange for a buyout. By Sunday afternoon, you were close to making a deal. But then out of nowhere, the Financial Services Authority in the UK, where Barclays was from, canceled the whole thing and your last hope vanished. By Sunday evening, Lehman knew their case was hopeless. Where do you want to be in five years? I had an old Studebaker truck and $300 when I started this company. In a few years, my sons will be ready to take over and then I'd like to... Uh, I never told anybody this. Uh, I want to live in Paris and go to cooking school. Hey, that's what I want to do. Will I have the money to do it? You can get there from here. With Shearson Lehman Brothers. With no plan C, your bankruptcy lawyers were called in on Sunday evening. The lawyers were through the dead of the night, and just before 2 a.m. on Monday, September 15, 2008, they sent the email to file Lehman Brothers for bankruptcy. After 158 years, the behemoth was no more. Where do you want to be in 20 years? Well, my father worked for the same company for 39 years. He got two weeks vacation, but we never traveled far. He was saving to put three kids through college. At 65, he retired. At 67, he died. How can I invest so that after my kids graduate, I can enjoy the second half of my life? You can get there from here. The impact of Lima's collapse affected the world like nothing else before it. The fact that a business so big, so respected, so valuable could crash and burn like that left companies all over the US in a panic. For all they knew, they could be next. Trust in the US markets was suddenly non-existent, and the economy was going to be paying for it much sooner than expected. Everyone was calling their banks and financial advisors non-stop. Some of the biggest corporations were suddenly confessing that they didn't have enough money to pay their employees or fund their operating costs. None of the banks around the world were confident enough to lend to each other. The whole financial industry basically came to a standstill. And just two days after declaring bankruptcy, Barclays Bank bought most of the assets they wanted from Lehman Brothers in the first place. And the Lehman Brothers employees? And Dick Fold, Wall Street's golden boy, was suddenly unemployed. The 2008 financial crisis had finally arrived, and it was all triggered by Lehman Brothers. Today, Dick Fold, the former CEO of Lehman Brothers, owns a company offering consulting services to high net worth clients. Lehman Brothers has become the scapegoat for the 2008 financial crisis. But the truth is, most of Wall Street was doing the same thing Lehman was doing, but they just didn't fall first. See, there are two sides to every hyper successful person. What they tell the general public about their success, it's all about hard work, consistency, perseverance, and what they actually think and do behind closed doors when the cameras are off, like writing the hype of toxic mortgage-backed securities. Because I want to reach in, rip out their heart, and eat it before they die. The problem is you're never going to learn about how they actually operate unless you're already in successful circles, because it's not politically correct. Not that I want to hurt them. Don't get that, please, because that's just not who I am. I am soft, I'm lovable. Because if the elite did admit how they actually thought, they would be pillaged and sent to the guillotine. Or if you're Dick Fold, you end up being the scapegoat in front of the entire country. I take full responsibility for the decisions that I made and for the actions that I took. That's why you're never going to learn this stuff in business school. You're never going to learn this stuff from your friends and family. But you will learn it here in our new feature length 40 minute plus documentaries breaking down how the world really works in all its Machiavellian glory. But the thing is, I don't want to get canceled or scapegoated like Dick Fold. So we're not going to be releasing these to the public. All you have to do if you want to get this education that they will never teach you in business school is click the join button below right next to the subscribe button. If you don't see the button, there's a link in the video description below. Once you sign up, you'll get exclusive access to the first documentary coming out in a few days on Monsanto, the company that owns the world's food supply. Or you'll get access immediately if it's already out by the time you're watching this. 
And unlike an MBA, I'm not going to charge you $55,000 to $161,000 to learn this stuff. Nope, just $5 a month for longer documentaries of the same videos you love, that you would not be able to see anywhere else. And this $5 a month is just to cover the cost to produce these videos. Give it a try for a month and if you don't think this knowledge is worth it, pause the video and click the join button below right now.